Professor uh, Klaus uh, von Kanna Bornheim uh, here in Kozen at uh, the Department of Archaeology. And we have a very special opportunity here uh, today uh, because, uh, as, as, as Professor Klaus uh, von Kanna Bornheim is uh, going to speak about uh, Viking Age Heilhabu. Research and Managing of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So, please, the voice is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Pavel. Thank you very much uh, to the audience to join a lecture at lunchtime. Um, I've just seen that lunchtime normally is spent in restaurants uh, in Pilsen and uh, that you are enjoying the very special quality of um, of food uh, and, and beer here. So I admire you that you are going to listen to my lecture. I'm very happy and very proud to be here in Pilsen of the Institute. I've heard a lot uh, in talks with my friend Vladimir Salac, whom I know for many, many years now. And I'm especially thankful to you, Pavel, that you showed me around uh, your institute and uh, the archeology span here in Pilsen. I want to give you an example, let's say, of applied archaeology, because um, making uh, uh, one of the, I would say, uh, most interesting sites of Northern Europe, early medieval archaeology, and research making it a World Heritage Site is a long process which requires a lot of management, as the title of the lecture says but on the other hand is also connected with, the quest with questions of uh, history of research and newer developments because um, after becoming a World Heritage Site it uh, creates a lot of new challenges uh, of which we never thought before. Let's have a short look at the place. I will show it on the map as well later, but this is the site of Hedebu, Haithabu, the early medieval site of Viking Age, starting in the 9th century, ending in the mid uh, 11th century. And as you see, it's not covered by um, uh, houses. It's a green meadow, which is for an early medieval site, or medieval site, of course, it's a, it's a wonder, because it's a green meadow where we work with. And when we wrote the application for the World Heritage Site, we only presented it in winter photos. This because the people around the world think that there's always winter in Viking Age Northern Europe, which is of course not true, but um, psychologically it was important to show it like that. And you see again, the seven houses we have rebuilt it here, that is the semicircular wall, and this is the Viking Museum, Hedebu, which is luckily very close to the site, which makes the site even more attractive because our visitors can have a look at the museum, walk around and look at the wonderful landscape. And we have the Dannewerke, which is connected with, uh, uh, with uh, Viking Age um, um, structures, but it's has a much longer history. We know now that it starts maybe in the fifth century from con uh, connecting with the early C14 dates we have. And let's say the story ends in the Second World War when it was used as a, uh, as a, a wall against British tanks. But the Germans were not quite clear whether the Britons would come from the south or the north. So they were in, in problems in a way. And uh, I will not focus on the Dannewerke so much in my lecture, but as I already said, when presenting it to the World uh, Heritage Committee, we're also concentrating on winter photos. Um, the Danneberger itself is 27 kilometers long, um, and it's what we regard as one of the 
most um, of the biggest archaeological monuments in, in Northern Europe. What does it mean, a World Heritage Site? It's the World Heritage Convention that word was signed in the 1970s, and uh, it says that um, properties should be inscribed of the World Heritage because of their outstanding universal value. That's the key word, O-U-V, the outstanding universal value. And the convention has developed through all the years. And now you see we have cultural sites, natural sites, mixed sites. That means where culture and nature is combined. And this is the state uh, of the World Heritage Site of last year. And I think you see it's 1,100. Uh, 57 sites, transponder research sites, and you see there is a clear concentration in Europe, Turkey, Iran, then we have here India and China, and the Mesoamericas, and the Inca sites here, but other parts are, of course, quite empty because there are no sites or there are natural sites. And this is one of the com complicated topics connected with the World Heritage Convention, that there is an overload in Europe, which makes European applications much more complicated than others, let's say, coming from the Africas or the South Americas, for example. So this is something the World Heritage Committee has to deal with. And how is the situation in Germany? Germany all the time was very active in becoming uh, becoming sites on the World Heritage List. And you see up to now, it's 51 sites that are on the list. The first one was the Aachener Dom, here inscribed in 1978. And um, of course, Lübeck here, 43, is archaeologisch. No, das sind wir, Entschuldigung, nein, sorry. Hansestadt Lübeck was a very early site on the World Heritage List, and it's said that the application for Lübeck was two pages to become a, uh, to be inscribed on the World Heritage List, while our application in 2018 or uh, 17 was about 500 pages. So bureaucracy is in the World Heritage Committee and ICOMAS um, um, very much. So you see there, there are some archaeological sites like the Limes now, um, uh, which is inscribed newly in the Niedergermanische Limes, and we have Hedebü and the Dannewerke 43 here up in the, in the far north. And it's astonishing that Bavaria has so little. They don't need it, so it's very easy. So they are so proud, they don't need it. So in our application, of course, we also had to refer to the history of research, and I don't want to go through the history of research of uh, Heidelberg and all, but um, of course, of special interest is the phase um, between 1933 and 1939. And this is the excavation team of the 30s, and as we are all used to costumes, I think this is a very interesting picture, because these are the workers, and these are the academists. <laughs> so wearing different hats. And one of the most important persons is the little one here, that's Herbert Jankun, uh, who was in charge for the research for many years uh, before the Third Reich, in the Third Reich, and afterwards, always, as well. So um, he was born in Eastern Prussia, and uh, already as a 23-year-old young researcher, he documented thousands of uh, Roman period finds from East Prussia. Um, and, but then when he was 28 years, in 1939, he was um, uh, employed in, in Heiterbu by Gustav Schwantes because already at that time, Herbert Jankun was one of the most talented German archaeologists. We have to say it's like that. But then, after 1933, he engaged himself uh, very much with the Nazis, and therefore we, had, uh, we have the, the Hakenkreuz Fahne above Haithabu uh, in this period, which we say, which creates a brown shadow on our research. But we 
of course, um, uh, we look at it very critically. So what was Herbert Jankun? What was his biography? And you seen, as I said, he was born in East Prussia and uh, started as a young man in studying in Königsberg. And he had the luck to be educated by, um, among, uh, by one of the most talented and influential professors of that time in the Eastern Baltic area, Max Ebert, who, uh, who uh, created a whole school which, um, uh, which was influencing East Baltic archaeology, uh, not only in, in East Prussia, but also in Latvia, Estonia, and, and Lithuania, like Ginters, Sturms, and so on, names you probably, uh, you probably know. And then he came, uh, he finished his doctor thesis on the belt equipments of the older Roman period on the Sambian Peninsula, and joined CSR, and then became, uh, found the sponsors, sponsorship by, uh, by Heinrich Himmler and the uh, scientific organization of the SS, the SS Ahnerb. So that was something that was very, very important for that time, uh, for the kind of research that was done, that was done in Hedeby. And you see that he wrote himself, Ich war ein gläubiger Nationalsozialist, and I think we can believe it. Um, uh, so, but um, he was also an inventor and he was an excellent excavator, and we still can uh, work with his documentation, which is excellently done for that time. So that creates the problems for us, how to deal. If he would have done bad documentation and, and bad research, we would say, forget it. Uh, but so he was very much interested in photography and made excellent photos, for example, and of course he connected it still with, with Heinrich Himmler, who was uh, visiting Hedeby in the late 30s as well. And he found one of the great treasures of Hedeby, uh, namely the waterlogged deposits, the, 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 the places where the table water, the ground water, was affecting the wooden structures. And the idea was at that time um, to find settlement patterns and to, patterns and to understand the settlement as it's, how it functions. And um, at the very end, now after the Schietzels excavations, we have uh, mapped in our GIS system 35,000 timbers from building activities, which is for an early medieval town in the north quite a lot for. And medieval town in Bohemia, it's nothing. But, um, you see, this is one of the real treasures of Hedeby that we have, the waterlogged deposits still there, and we will have a look at the finds a little bit later. So the excellent preservation in parts of Hedeby um, was something that was um, important for the, the impact of the research or the, the, the direction of the research. And then Jan Kuhn was publishing, of course, and he came out with his first book, Herbert Jan Kuhn, Heiderbu, eine germanische Stadt der Frühzeit, <laughs> which 11th edition, as far as I remember, was published in 1972, of course, with a different title and with a different um, foreword. And, and you see that one of the aims of that time was, it's in a way hidden already in the title, Heiterbus Stellung in der deutschen Geschichte, in der deutschen Geschichte not in the history of Scandinavia. So it should, the aim of SS Ahnerbe and Herbert Jan Kuhn was to bring it into German history. And you can see it here in his, in an article, Weist in den Deutschen Westen, Deutsche Geschichte, Heinrich I, of course, Deutsche Kaufmannsgeschlechter, Pionierarbeit Deutsche, Deutsche Könige, um, was haben wir? Besetzung Ostdeutschlands und so on and so on. It's a whole bunch of Germanization in the sense of Germany, Deutschland. And that was, um, that was his great, uh, was the great aim of this research. We all formulated this, of course, and we were aware of these problems which might cause, let's say, resistance by, by our Danish neighbors, for example, to inscribe it on the World Heritage List, or may others maybe say that it's influenced by 
the, the research of, um, of Herbert Jankun and SSM Herbert too much. Therefore, for, we formulated it very clearly and we opened our archives, for example. So there should be no secrets on that. So, but how to start such a process of becoming a World Heritage Site? And when we started the process, I was thinking it would take two or three years and then the thing is over and it's done because we write a small application and we deliver it and then it's okay. But that was naive in a way. At the very end, it took 14 years to become, to get it on the World Heritage List. And this is maybe a little bit more than average, but if somebody of you later in his professional career is planning a World Heritage application, so you should think about at least eight, maybe 12 years of work, continuous process to get it, to get it on the list. It's nothing that you do by that. So, and I was an optimist, and I was thinking I do it like that. But it was much more complicated. And you see, we have a decision of our regional parliament, because in Germany, the culture is the duty of the federal Bundesländer. It's not, we have no Bundeskulturministerium. It's not a central uh, um, uh, structure. It's a decentralized structure, Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg, and so on and so on. Probably you know if you have done some museum work or excavations in Germany up to now. And you see there was a decision of our parliament. And in the first round, we tried to make our application as an international serial nomination, which would have had some advantages. And we combined Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, Schleswig-Holstein, and Latvia. And here you see the announcement four years later in Kiel, and that was our Prime Minister, Peter Harry Carstensen. He was a funny man. He likes laughing. And it was under the leadership of Iceland. And this is the Icelandic culture minister, Thorger Durgunnastotir. So she has a real Icelandic name. And that's a Danish ambassador and Swedish ambassador and so on and so on. And everybody was happy and very proud. And we were addressing the audience in English. And then suddenly Thorger Durgunnastotir was speaking perfectly German. And everybody was surprised and was looking at this charming uh, minister from Iceland. And it figured out that her husband was a very famous trainer for handball teams. So, uh, so she lived in Germany for a long time. And then after uh, seven years, in 2015, we delivered our application to the World Heritage Committee. This is a complicated process. You have to write the application, you have to deliver it at the World Heritage Office in Paris. They adopt it. They in, put up an evaluation process, which is done by ICOMOS, International Council of Monuments and Sites, which is kind of the World Heritage Organization connecting heritage, uh, building heritage, archaeological heritage. They send their experts. They make an on-desk evaluation and uh, on-site evaluation, and they were traveling around to Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and so on and so on. But already in 2015, we knew that we would fail. It was very frustrating because this World Heritage Committee has delegates from every country that has signed the World Heritage Convention. So we presented our Haithabu and Dannewerke, you see it here, we'll see that picture later, on a global level. So there were the delegates from Somalia, Djibouti, China, India, Tibet, Russia, France, North America, and so on. And then they, ICOMOS presented it, and they said, it's not a good idea, forget it. And we knew that it would come, and I was extremely depressed. And it was the only time that I broke in in a hotel bar to get a bottle of wine. So it's once in my life like this. And I was very depressed because, um, yeah, it was a very special moment to present such a 
pr project on this, on this level and then to fail, that was not nice. So 2015 for me was not a good year, but uh, then we spoke to our government and they said, yes, we don't give up. We make, we split up the international application and put them into different parts. Every national partner do it like the partner wants it to do. And therefore we wrote the application Hedeby and the Dannewerke, the archaeological border landscape of Hedeby and the Dannewerke. That was our World Heritage application delivered in 2017 with the application and the management plan all together around 450 pages or something like that. You find it in the internet. Uh, and so, and then the evaluation process started and we will hear about the, um, uh, the result a little bit later. So, what does it mean? We are in the very northern tip of Germany. Um, here we have the, the Danish, the Danish, um, muss ich gucken, ja, we have, we have the Danish uh, German border and uh, here we have a kind of a fjord, it's not really a fjord, the Schlei, which is coming from the northeast, 36 kilometers into the Jutland Peninsula. And you see here in deep green, the marshes, marshy areas, which reach the Gees, the sandy areas here around Hollingstedt, so that we have here an inland, kind of an inland pass, which is about 24 kilometers wide. So this is the Dannewerk, and here at the west, eastern end of the Dannewerk, we have um, Haidabu with a semicircular wall. So you can, I think you can understand that it's part of a bigger system, of a kind of a landscape, and different phases. But I don't want to go too deep in that. We see it here, Haidabu, Hadebuanoa, the Schlei, and then we have this building, which is extremely interesting because it shows a new strategical concept and is, it was done by the um, obviously mad Danish king, Harald Bluetooth. He was mad in a way because he had a Bluetooth and had tooth pain all the time. That created, obviously, you have to cut this later. Okay? Um, uh, so he built a, a new wall here, Kograben, which uh, is uh, late 10th century, obviously, and we have other faces here. And one of the interesting uh, monuments is here, it's the Seesperre von Wesholm. Uh, these are the names, sorry. And this is an underwater blockade built in the seventh, latest 7th century, early Haithabu, uh, uh, early Danneberg parts, and it's built like wooden lockhouses, the Blockhäuser three to four meters, thousands of timbers in the water, and it's about 1.2, maybe 800 meters long. So I just go back to show it again. It's here. So it's not only the earthen, earthen walls of the Dannewerke and the brick wall here of Waldemar, but we also have uh, underwater blockades. So that makes all also a kind of a maritime uh, monument. No. So what we have to do for the World Heritage application is we have to define the core zone of the monument, the buffer zone, and the zone of wider interest. And the core zone is the, it's the red one here. It's untouchable. So if you change anything here, you get a problem. So this is the heart of the outstanding universal value on the application. And you see we have the Seesperre here and the Dannewerke here and we have Haithabu and the harbor of Haithabu we put also in, in this thing. And then we have the buffer zone because the buffer zone means that nothing should happen that hurts the integrity, the visual integrity, for example, of the monument. So nobody would be allowed to build new houses here or to establish a factory or something like that. It would be the, the, 
heritage um, management would um, uh, would not would not ever give a permission because then the World Heritage Committee would say, okay, the monument is not functioning anymore. You lose the outstanding universal value. Bye bye. And as Schleswig-Holstein is so flat, we have to say if we want to have the visual integrity guaranteed, we have to build around a zone of about five kilometers to each side where we also make a kind of a special control what is happening. And our big problems are windmills because now they are coming and uh, connected with a crisis of energy and so everybody wants to buy build windmills, but we don't want to have them here. Let's see what the future brings. So what you have to do is to define the core zone, the buffer zone, and to develop a concept how you will keep the monument in the state that you have at the moment you, uh, it is inscribed. And doing something like that in Germany is very complicated because we are specialists in bureaucracy. And you see here that we have to deal with the Federal Republic, the state of Schleswig-Holstein, upper level heritage protection authority, upper level nature protection authority, lower level heritage protection authorities, lower level nature protection authorities, municipalities, and so on and so forth. All these people have to be involved. And we will see the results later it was a big challenge to do it, but it's an incredible chance to do it. And we just Pavel, discussed community archaeology. That happens on this level. So if we, if, we, if, we, if we are able to integrate the municipalities and the people in the municipalities, then it would be quite possible, not easy, but the chances to bring up such a process are much, much better than to, to make it in a bottom-down process and fight against the the municipalities and the people there. Of course, there will be, and there are restrictions on the monument, but um, uh, if we have the municipalities and so on our sides, maybe easier to, to, to deal with them. So it's a plaidoyer, I would say, for, um, for transparency and communication with local people to get them involved in all our archeological processes. Um, so, but what does it mean in terms of archaeology? And as early medieval archaeology is one of the um, focuses here at the Institute, I want to go a little bit into the archaeology of Hyderabu as well. So, you see the semicircular wall here and the settlement area, which is about 24 hectares. And as I said, we have no new modern building activity in here. And what is also very positive and which is super for all the management. All this area belongs to the museum. So as I was the director of the museum, I was the owner of that. So what we said to the farmers, what they were allowed to do and what they not were allowed to do. So this is, a, and then other areas around, this um, belongs also to the monument, but the core is here with the settlement and with the harbor, with the harbor area. And what makes Haithabu unique, of course, it's, it's its position in the overall trading networks of the early medieval period of the 9th, 10th, and 11th century. And I just show it to the, to the east. So we have, of course, such places like Staraya, Ladoga, Novgorod, which are involved, Gnestovo, important place on the triangle between Daugava, uh, Volga, and Dnieper, Kiev, of course, we had connections with Kiev at that time, or via the Caspian Sea and farther to the south, the connection to the Silk Road. All this is evidenced by material in Haithabu, and we will later see uh, maps that show us that it's the same to the west, to the north, and to the, uh, to the south. Everybody is clear, but it was quite clear from the early beginning of the research that Haithabu as a trading town trade it has a, plays an important role in, in these networks, not only by the written sources, but primarily by the archaeological materials. And what is, of course, important is the harbor. And Schietzel was excavating there. It's not the best photo, I admit, 
but this is Haithabu wrack number one. It's a warship of 36 meters, which was preserved in parts, and it was built in 985, so it looks like that Harald Bluetooth was in charge for, uh, for this building of this ship, which is a real, uh, a real warship of that time. But Haithabu, of course, is also important as a trading site. But when looking on the green meadows all the time, nobody was quite clear about this settlement structure. And as I said, Yang Kuhn and the An Abbe, they were thinking about the settlement structures. They want to find out how the town works. And uh, therefore, in the early 2000 years, we started geophysic prospections. And it was my first DFG project in Hyderabu. And everybody said, Klaus, it will not function. You don't have to measure. And I invited four teams, uh, among Neugebauer from Vienna, who was measuring there, and others. Neubauer was starting here on, a, on the 12th of April at 3 o'clock with his wonder machines, these geophysics machines, you know them probably. And after two hours, I came to him and I was shivering because everybody said, we will see nothing. And then he said, Klaus, be calm. Everything runs well. Everything is contaminated by structures. So we, had a, we have an incredible amount of signals and get the idea of uh, the, maybe the youngest archaeological stru structures that are still preserved in the earth. Because only 5% of Haithobu is excavated. 95% is not excavated. So you see pit houses here, some in rows. We know from other information that this was the area of iron smithing. Therefore, we have these intensive um, geomagnetic signals. Uh, from this here, we think that it's where the glass makers were sitting. And then we see this street here, um, which is running parallel to the shoreline. It's the Harbor Street, a harbor city, harbor town, a harbor, it's a harbor street. And you see quite regular structures here which are combined, combining maybe workshops with warehouses or something like that. Of course, this is very difficult to see from the geomagnetic. And then there's kind of a little bit empty space here. And this was already known before, the gray field of Haithabu where there were some excavations, and we think that there are about 10 to 12,000 burials left. But nobody is so much interested in the burials because they contain so little archaeological material. So, um, and then if we make a reconstruction, it never has looked like that, but it may have looked like that. So this is the explanation for that. And you see the Harbor Street, some warehouses, um, concentration of pit houses with workshops, the empty space here, and this is still hypothetical, but we have the jetties here, the Landungsbrücken, which are very, very important, and Schietzel has excavated two of them, uh, uh, and the material is recently published, or some years ago published by Sven Kalmay. But you see it has a kind of a structure, a kind of an idea how the settlement uh, has looked like. And what about the archaeological materials? And this is, again, the, the, uh, I just come back. In the drier parts that are a little bit higher, we have pit houses. But in the parts where it's wet, we have halls, also einschiffige Hallengebäude. So we have two very different types of houses are built there. And as we have the waterlogged deposits, we have an incredible amount, like in a normal medieval town, I would say, like in the dwell in front of your institute, the backyard of your institute, with a lot of wooden artifacts, organic artifacts, um, um, uh, combs of um, Geweih, what heißt denn das nochmal? Horn? No. Antler. Antler, of course, glass, fibulas. Um, other things, an incredible widespread inventory of, um, of things. And what Schietzel did, I just want to tell the students, he was very clever. 
when th there were doctor theses given to students, and Schietzel was the excavator, the students first of all had to deliver a Karteikarte, uh, analog file, uh, was heißt ein Formblatt. So, and when it was on comms, they have to write some, where was it found, it, um, how big is it, uh, is it antler, is it what, and is it fragment, what part, and, and then the form blood cut was, the student has to do it, Dina 5, and then Schietzel was checking it. And then he said, yes, you have to think about this and that, and was a correction, and then the student has to write all his finds on this uh, form letter. And therefore, we have 240,000 form letter. Of every, mostly of every single find. Because Schietzel said, I do never know whether the doctor thesis will be finished. So what remains for me is the file, the analog file. And we are very proud of that. We can use it. So, um, uh, but this enormous amount of, of uh, finds, of course, creates um, a lot of problems. So, and therefore, I, I have called Hedebu a monster site because it's a, it's a scientific monster. You, whatever you do, it raises new questions and new problems. And just to show it, um, as I said, we have uh, the different ceramic vessels on CERN. Sintbeck was working on this, published it in, in, um, in antiquity and putting together all these these different finds and the network analyzes, and I think it's a very, very good visualization of which role Hedeby plays, for example, in the direction of Norway or Sweden or um, to North Denmark or even, uh, and that will be important later for my lecture, to Eastern England, like York, Norwich, Thetford, and so on. And on the other hand, you see the Frankish um, trading system here which is um, connected with the, with the sites in, in the Netherlands and in, in, in northern Holland. Uh, very, very interesting uh, picture and visualization of what Hedebu's role in the trade network of that time on the basis of ceramics could be. But we changed the system a little bit and that created also some tensions, as you can think, because in 2003, <clears throat> I invited Danish detector, detector, detector archaeologists from Bornholm, which were working extremely successful in Bornholm for many, many years. I invited them to make detector archaeology in Hedeby. And everybody was looking and thought that I now will become a criminal um, doing this metal detecting. But uh, I was convinced uh, that we have to do it and not only for reasons to save the material for us, it's quite well protected, but also to, to find out what is going on in the upper levels of the, of the settlement, which are, of course, the destroyed um, settlement parts. So these um, detector archaeologists were working there very, very intensively, and this was the result we had around 12,000 objects, of whom maybe 1,500 to 2,000 are diagnostic for Viking age. And we were not going on iron, of course, because then we, they would have been dull after, um, after some weeks. So you see it's an intensive concentration of, of finds. And uh, luckily, just some Two months ago, Volker Hilberg was finishing his work on this metal detector finds, and I want to show you the results. And it's, um, I think, for early medieval archaeology and for the methodology of a, such an early medieval site, it's of decisive um, importance what the results are. What we know is that we have quite a lot of Islamic coins in, in Hedebi. And they are of different times. You can see there is Abbasidische, Samanidische coins here. Some of them are cut 
which is quite normal as they go in a weight system uh, um, as Gewicht Silver. And uh, if we look at the structures like uh, these dirhams come to the north, it's quite clear that uh, Transoxanian, uh, north of, of, the, of, of Afghanistan, let's say, this is now nowadays um, Kazakhstan, plays an important role with Samarkand and Khorasm uh, to transport the dirhams via Bulga on the Volga River, Novgorod, Staraya Ladoga, into the western systems of trade in early medieval town, early medieval times. And of course, Baghdad is involved in this via the Caspian Sea, Etel and Bulga again to the north. And if we look at the distribution uh, maps and the, the, the time span that dirhams are, um, uh, are in different places like Norway, Kaupang, Upokra, in western Sweden, or Povigen, on Gotland. They are quite different, but um, what is quite clear, Haithabu has, in the 10th century, an enormous impact of dirhams. A lot of dirhams are coming to our side, and around 950, it's over. So no dirhams in the north anymore. And that is, of course, it's a problem, not only on the settlement sites, but if we look at Gothland, um, it's quite clear that there are some silver hordes of the 10th century, of the, around 1,000, where there are Western coins, a lot of Western coins, but only very, very few Islamic coins. So something happens at that time with this, uh, with this system. And, uh, and it was under discussion, of course, for many years, not quite clear. And what was said, the question was, where is the silver coming from that the northern, the Viking Age Scandinavia is using for, for ornaments, rings, and so on. And they have an enormous amount, they need an enormous amount of silver. And as it's not coming at the end of the 10th century from the east anymore, where it's coming from? And it's quite clear that the Harz area plays an important role one of the important actors. And Klapauf and Bartels have shown that at that time, at the 10th century, early 11th century, in the Harz, silver mining was coming up again. So I'm a fan of Montana archaeology, you know, in the six. It's something that happens here as well, I think. And, uh, but it's quite clear that we have such an impact from, uh, from the silver. But the question is where um, where was the silver minted and how was it brought to the north? And it's quite clear that we have um, in the late 10th century in Haithabu a massive influx of East Frisian imitations, for example, of Frankish coins in, the, in Haithabu from 950, 960, 970 on. So it's the Frankish silver that, um, that is verdrängen, that is pressing out the dirhams. But it's not quite clear whether the dirhams do not come and the Frankish silver rushes in or whether the silver rushes in, the Frankish silver rushes in and the dirhams are pressed out. That's quite a thing under discussion. I think it's a very important question. Maybe we will find out um, someday. And you see as it's the purity of the coins is um, tested. They know quite well of the silver contents of these coins. It's quite good. It deteriorates during the time. And on the other hand, it is in the economic process. So therefore, it is tested so many times. And if we look on that, what the North can give. So, and this is also quite important to look at the of the, um, of, the, of the metals that are available, available in the north. There is no silver. It's coming in this area. We do not find any silver. It comes from different areas. We do not find copper, which is coming from Sweden, but only from the 13th century on. And silver is much later, but we have iron. 
So iron production since the Roman period here in northern, in southern Norway is quite, quite uh, important. So that means when they were producing their weapons, for example, they were they could depend on Scandinavian materials in their closer region. But when they were looking for silver, copper, brass, lead, and tin, they have to look on totally different networks of communication and raw materials supply uh, for something like Hedebu or, let's say, southern Scandinavia. And all this is, of course, connected with the montaneous resources here in, in, uh, in the Mittelgebirgszone, where we have, for example, uh, uh, lead from Soest, which is also produced during the Roman period. So this is the area where uh, late Haithabu is concentrating on when it goes to things of when it goes to the questions of supply of, of raw materials. But of course, there could be other sources, like for example, um, brass messing uh, from the Niederrhein near Aachen which is going to England, but which could come via England in Knut's time in the 10th century, late early 11th century, during the trading networks to Hedeby on this way also. So it's not only one way, it could be, you know, with transmission stations in between, which is, of course, extremely interesting to find out where the excess, how the excess of the mineral resources in the late 10th, early 11th century in Hedeby is functioning. And that only this research only functions on the basis of metal detecting finds. It's not in our stock. It was very, very few of these materials were in a stock like uh, silver barren or these late coins. So that means this picture is only available um, as we have the metal detecting finds. And you can see it like late um, small finds. They are all over the settlement area. So that means even if we have no structures, building structures, all the settlement is active at the time. That is our interpretation, Volker Hilberg's interpretation of that. And it's also connected with elites, which we see on these check pieces from horse harnesses. You see this here, where there was only one or two fragments before we did the metal detecting. Now we have 10 or 12 or something like that, so which are widespread in Denmark and which are connected with riders, with people sitting on horses, elites that are active at that time. And on the other hand, we have these strape ends, um, uh, which are connected with stirrups, which are known for metal detecting finds in England now in dozens and hundreds. Denmark is not mapped, but here we have two or three of them. So it means there are the connections also to, to East England or South, South England. And at the very end of this material, again, um, these uh, straight ends of the true hill type, which are um, uh, indicating, um, indicating the early, the 10th, advanced sense in 11th century in different styles, like Ringerich and Ursens. I won't, don't want to go too deep in that, but you see we have quite a lot of them, and that shows that Hedeby was functioning in the 11th century as well, and also the weaponry is going like that. And just put in this slide which Volker Hilberg gave me, um, you see that our idea how settlements in the north were functioning is, has totally changed now with, the, with these results of Hedeby because um, um, the, the, the new settlements like Lund and, Lund and Roskelle developed, but later than Hedeby. And we have coinage still in the 11th century in Hedeby. And we have the economic context to the Ottonian and Salians, and of course we have the connections to England at that time. So, Hedebu is in the late, the late Hedebu is in a really new stage of discussion. I only can recommend, I will send the book to you, I will, and I can only recommend it to put it in, uh, into your education because it's, I think it's a very nice book. I'm very proud that Volker Hilberg produced it. So it took um, eight years. Uh, so what about our 
World Heritage um, think. And you see, in 2018, we were again, 2018, we were again presenting it to the World Heritage Committee. It was in Bahrain. I was not there, but my colleagues were there. It was very hot, very expensive. And you see again the World Heritage Committee, Brazil, Norway, Spain, Lesotho, and so on and so on. They are sitting here negotiating for um, many five or six days. <coughs> and then on the, I don't know if you remember, my uni on the 30th of June at three o'clock, our project was presented. And you see what, that is the, the reporting gentleman from ICOMOS. He is giving a speech of five minutes and explained the application. And you see, everything is okay. Comparative analysis, very good. Why comparative analysis? Because you have to show that something like what you have is for the first time of the World Heritage List. So if you say, we have uh, uh, 10 other Viking Age towns that are on the World Heritage List, then you don't have to start the process. Then integrity, that means how the thing is preserved. Authenticity, as integrity means visual integrity. Authenticity, how is it, um, uh, um, how is it preserved? Then we have the criteria. Then are the boundaries okay? Is the protection okay? Is the law giving okay? Conservation or okay, management? Tuck, 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 tuck. I was sitting in front of my computer screen. I already had a bottle of champagne in, in my backhand. And after also 14 years of work, the whole process of adopting our application took six, six minutes and 36 seconds. And then Sheikha Haya Rashid El Khalifa, the world the chairperson, said the very important sentence, I therefore declare draft decision 428B29 adopted. That was all. Since that moment, Hedebu and the Danneberger were on the World Heritage List. I opened my bottle of champagne and had a nice day. And you see my colleagues here, um, Matthias Malok, who was writing the application, or was in charge of writing it, and Ikerot was the new head of the management heritage uh, um, office in Schleswig-Holstein. They were very happy. And I invited them uh, to the bar and it was a Ritz-Carlton hotel, and you can imagine what I have to pay later. And so, Hedebu is inscribed by the Criterion 3 and Criterion 4. It shows that it is um, a, a center of maritime and exchange. It um, it's, has connections with all over the world and Europe and so on and so on. You can read it in detail, but it depends on the criteria that the World Heritage Convention allows to be inscribed, uh, to have a monument inscribed in. So it has to be an extraordinary monument and so on and so on. But uh, you can read it or can see it later, but this is what the outstanding universal value of Hedeby and Danneberger now is, and this is fixed. Nothing can change. So if something if a new research would be done and it figured out that we have three other done workers or something like that, no, this is fixed. They will not touch it anymore. That is very important. And, of course, the public was very much interested in what was going on. We were on the top news and the TV and so on and so on. And you see even the Danish Queen was there uh, in 2019. It was a rainy day and she lifted this uh, sign in front of a, of a museum. She's an archaeologist, well-educated archaeologist in Cambridge and Aarhus. And I was guiding her several times. And she's asking really complicated questions. Really complicated. It's no fun yeah? on archaeology. So very, very clever, very much interested, very sympathetic persons. And you see as it's... The Dannenwerke is a Danish monument, still in the mentality of the people. You see, they are standing around with the Danish flags and are celebrating. Um, 
And then what does it mean for the visitors of our museum? And you see, we have here the figures of 2017. And then we have the figures of 2018. This is, in fact, the day after the inscription of the World Heritage List. 84% more visitors, 58, 90%, 53% more visitors. So we were going up on from 100,000 to 160,000 visitors in the, in the Viking Age, Viking, uh, Viking Museum in Hedeby. Now we begin to think whether it's maybe too much. So it could be a problem, could be a problem to have so many visitors there, but of course it's nice. And we have made a management plan, and this is something which is very, very important. How to deal with the monument in future? What does it mean in future? What are we going to do? What means public transport? What means sustainability? What means education? What means research? And so on. This is all put in, the, in this letter. And what is very important, and I come back to the thing how we involve local people, it is signed by many, many people who are where the municipalities are part of the World Heritage Site, like, for example, Hollingstedt or um, uh, Danneberg or Schleswig and so on. All these majors signed this document. They know what is written in there, and they know that this is our kind of a, um, law that we have given ourselves um, for the management of the place. So there are different responsibilities for protection, research, communication, marketing, regional tourism and development, which plays, of course, an important role. What does it mean for the regional development? And you see that a lot of institutions are involved. And if you forget one, you get a problem. So they get angry. So, but let's look on research. We have the Archaeological Landesamt, the university, Museum of Archaeology, the Research Institute, or the protection it's done between monument protection and natural protection. They have communicate. And of course, we have a lot of other tourist organizations and so on and so on. It's so many people that have to be involved. It's, re it's sometimes, if it's running well, it's really fun. But if there are conflicts, it's no fun. So because you have to balance all the different the different interests. And of course, we have a plan. What is endangering our monument most? And it's gravel mining, which is quite popular in the area. You see it has a very, very high value. Then agriculture, loss of substance by plowing, which is a problem. Other problems are not so, so serious, like dead wood in the trees or something like that. But all these threats are um, and risk, risk factors are, um, are um, defined and are in the focus. And then we have the management plan 2014. It was um, ready. Then it was uh, 2020. The new one was uh, done participation, revision, implementation, evaluation, and then 2030, a new management plan. So it's an ongoing process, on and on and on. So it's, um, um, it's a, a really a very, very important instrument, and it's something what is applied archaeology, I would say. And we will have new museums. This is the old one, the old Danneberg Museum. Uh, close, it's driven by the Danish minority, as you can see here. Uh, we are not in Denmark, we are in Germany. Yeah? And here is the Danneberg, you can see it here. And this is torn down, and now a new museum will be built. It is funded by August, uh, by um, R.P. Möller Fund. And if you see a container with a white star on a blue ground mask, maybe you know them, then it's transporting goods for this museum because they pay for it, and uh, it will be a museum in Scandinavian style. So you can see, so when you, if you come as a tourist or students on an excursion in two or three years, you can visit this museum and you will feel like in Scandinavia. So and this, I think this is very important for us. And I just come back to the very end of my lecture, what does it mean for the involvement 
of our regional and partners and we have a lot of conferences together with them where all the stakeholders, stakeholders sit together and explain what they want to have, the municipalities, the tourism people, the church, the youth education and so on and so on. And we have developed a vision. I just go through it because I have it in Czech language as well, translated by Vladimir and DeepL. And you see that up to 2030, we want to be the most important Viking Age destination, something like that. Other, we want to have bring it into the communities that they are more aware of the monument. What does it mean to live together with the thing? Uh, this is the most important destination for Viking Age in, in Germany. Uh, sorry. And, and the last one that we want to protect it and so on. And that, that was defined on such, in such a conference. It's not a bottom top down process, it's a bottom up process. So we have to communicate and sometimes we have to understand that the local people think in different ways than we as archaeologists do and that the museum people think in different ways like the heritage protection people think. So, and this is kind of the result. And then we have 13 strategical aims and I just want to point to this. One of the aims is that we want up to 2030 find 1 million euros of money for the development of our monuments from sponsors. So this is the defined aim. And you see it here in Czech language as well. Also eine Million, nee, das ist gar nicht Tschechisch. Hier habe ich vergessen zu übersetzen. Sorry. Da kommt das hier. Da. You see, we want, and this is where all the stakeholders agree on. So when there are new programs, EU programs or something like that, uh, they will help us to, to manage the, the thing. And what is very important is that the people from the tourism organization and the local regional economy, they want to have figures. Like you see here, we want to have 100, what does it mean? I have 100 conferences or something like that. Or we want to have um, 500 euros for this and that for marketing. So they say, we don't want to have it only in quality, we also want to have quantities. And therefore we have this in, the, in our aims up to 2030. For us as archeologists, sometimes it's a new kind of thinking, not, it, not every time easy, I can promise you. And at the very end, um, what is important for us, it's eine Flurbereinigung. It means that we have, want to have a look at all the farmers and all the land here, whether it gives, whether are there are possibilities to bring different places together, different fields together, not so that they do not cross or that they give us land that they don't plow anymore to endanger the monument and so on. It's a very, very complicated process, Flurbereinigung. It will take, it will take years. And there are so many partners involved again. So there's so many people to talk to. And it's a very <coughs> long planning uh, to do this. But I'm quite sure if we manage to do this land consolidation procedure and Flurbereinigung, it will it will increase our protection, the quality of our protection immensely. And it will help us to, to keep it. And maybe also there are so many monuments in, in Czech Republic for endangered by farming. So what to do with this maybe is something like a land consolidation process could be something. But okay, also we waited 10 years for the, uh, for the signal that they want to do it and it will take between 10 and 15 years until it's finished. So it's, you have to be very patient in that. So now the lunch lecture is over and I hope it was interesting for you. Thank you very much for your attention and maybe there are some, some questions. I'm very happy that I was allowed to present this project here for you and 
maybe there are some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for a great lecture. And uh, now we have some time for questions. Hey, I have a couple of questions. One, the first one concerning the protection and the establishment of this uh, heritage uh, world site. <coughs> it was quite surprising for me to hear what you said at the beginning that you, which, which, was, which was, as far as I remember, it was a common strategy to put into a similar kind of uh, site or monument to put countries, different countries together. It was with the universal models. It was the same with, for instance, the post medieval or very modern Baroque uh, um, fortifications and monuments here in central Rome. When, for instance, uh, uh, Slovakia wanted to, to, to ask about something and they said, go together with Hungary mm -hmm. and so on and so on. So it was quite surprising that finally you said that, that you were. You are uh, uh, given a, a advice to go just just alone. So that's one point. The other point is that uh, is, it, is, it, is it so now that uh, you think that if, for instance, uh, Berka would like to become or Bolin or whatever to become uh, in, enlisted into into world heritage, US world heritage scientists, that there, there is no chance in, in, in this sense. Um, also concerning the international serial nomination. At the beginning, I thought it would be easier to do it. And I thought that it would be good to give Hedebü and the Dannewerke in a Scandinavian framework, a Scandina more Scandinavian identity. Because if the monument would be endangered one time because of the law giving in Schleswig-Holstein, the Scandinavians, the people from Denmark and Sweden would say, you are endangering our world heritage project. Don't do it like that. Don't do it like that. So it would be kind of an overall international responsibility for the site. But we enclosed already inscribed sites and newly inscribed sites. Birka is inscribed already. It's on the World Heritage List. And ICOMOS was not convinced that that was a good idea because it would be the opening door for a lot of other unconventional applications in the international framework and they didn't like it. So, and maybe we did some mistakes as well, I have to admit, because our narrative on the World Heritage site was very complicated because there were already inscribed sites and newly to inscribed sites that have to be inscribed. And to put them in one good narrative with, which defines an outstanding universal value was extremely challenging. And at, at the very end, we have to say we failed. The concept was wrong because the rules are done by the World Heritage Committee and by ICOMOS, and we cannot change them. They have to change them if they want to have our application. Concerning Birka, of course, it's on the World Heritage List already, but part of our Viking Age nominations were the ring forts of Denmark, Trelleborg, Agersborg, Fürkat, and on the Vierte. They have now written a own application and it will be on the World Heritage, will become on the World Heritage list as well because ICOMO said we should split off our, 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 the monuments we have. And uh, so, but Volin, for example, the problem is, as far as I understand, that uh, the protection and the, 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 the site is not perfect and it's not as well preserved, for example, as what have done in Hedebü, but that is my, only my impression. Um, but it will become more difficult for early medieval northern European Baltic places to come to the World Heritage List, as now Birka, Jelling is on the list, and Hedebü is on the list, and maybe others to come as well. Kaupang is on the list. No, Kaupang is not on the list. It was. Uh, it, and it was not involved because the preservation is poor. And there's not so much preserved. So the Norwegians said they, were, were, they don't want, they wanted to have Hüllestad and the Greyfield of Bore uh, in the application. So, and in our old application. Hmm. And, uh, but I mean, because it started with, 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 with uh, Roman Limas, Limas yeah. Limas. It was Hadrian Wall, Hadrian Wall, it was yes. the first one. 
And then UNESCO, as far as I remember, just suggested, okay, so follow Hadrian's Wall and it will be put into one uh, line yeah. uh, with, the, with the continental and even line of plantation uh, near Asia and North Africa, African US. So that was the point which went, when the countries went yeah. to the black, uh, actually suggested to go together. Yeah. Is, and follow the starting point, which was the earliest one part of the Roman. Uh, yeah, but it it uh, they had a huge problem in the World Heritage Committee um, session in I think in 2018 or 19 when they want to bring it on and suddenly the Hungarian delegation said we don't want to have a quincum in it because we want to build new houses there and then it, and then something happened you know what we wanted don't wanted to have so that. The, the international system was not functioning, but the, the application of the limes as a, oh, the, the idea to have all the limes on the world heritage is extremely challenging because you have to bring together so many cultures of heritage management and how to put on Libya on the on that it's impossible in the moment. No. And Is there by now any idea or suggestion of the existence of the real existence of the church in the main as well? No. Uh, that was my dream to find the church. Because we know about it was there. Yes, it was there. Was it, it was there. It was there. And also, it is said, I think, to be the, one of the two first uh, wins in the uh, Viking uh, era. Also, do we have time, or is it, it, it so? If we, if I just go, go back to the to this when when I wrote the application for the for the uh, for the um, geomax geophysics projects DFG. I I said I want to learn about the sacral topo topography of Edebu means I want to find the church. I wanted to know about the topography of power of ADB because I was naive and thought I would find a place with a big hall. And I wanted to know about the, also the economic uh, topography of ADB. And as you see about the sacral topography, we do not see anything. I, I cannot see anything because there is no church. And ah, and I was naive also in a way because I thought the economic structure would mean a marketplace. Because in Schleswig, in around 1100, we have a marketplace. And I thought, okay, it will look like that. We have the church here, we have the marketplace here, and we have the hall here. So it was, well, naive. Well, and you see, we, have no, we didn't find a hall. The chance is, but it's very poor to find a, such a hall, which also, cons, also consists of large post hall via geomagnetic. Also that's extremely complicated and challenging. And you see, um, the, the, the church, yeah, it, uh, the idea was maybe some stone structures, a little bit something around and so on, no church here. And the marketplace was missing. And I was extremely disappointed that there's no marketplace. Until the work of Sven Kalmring came and it figured out that the marketplace are the jetties. That's where the market takes place. And that's therefore we have this enormous amount of finds in the harbor. And we have these huge jetties. They are up to 600 square meters, so you have seen them. Yeah, they, they, and they are built in 880, 900, and huge platforms, as big as this room here. And you don't need it just to, put, to fix the ship, but you use them as marketplaces. This is the marketplace. And in Schleswig, it begins like that, and later around the cathedral, the marketplace develops. So that means all my aims, topo topography of power, topography of church, let's say, and topography of trade failed. But I think, on the other hand, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So, but of course, it would be a dream to find the to find the church. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, one more question. Um, when applying for the UNESCO, um, I wonder if there were some maybe public, some people from the public who were actually against it. And if so, how, how actually did you deal with it? Was it like easy to sway them, you know, that this is like a unique, uh, unique uh, place and location to, mm -hmm. to put it to the UNESCO? Yeah. We are in a kind of a lucky situation that um, this, for example, this site is owned by us. Yeah. So that makes it much easier. Yeah. And the Dannenwerke is owned by several people, but mostly by the um, Kreis schleswig flensburg mm -hmm. So it's not in, uh, so that means we, we don't have to deal with so many owners. That's another thing, if you go to the old town of, of Prague, you have to deal with thousands and thousands of owners, investors, and so on, with very different interests. That's not so complicated here. It was more easy. The second point, the second point is the Dannewerke is in the awareness of the Danish people. It's in their school books. So that helps. And, and of course, high taboo is, is in, the, in the awareness, in the conscious awareness of people in Schleswig-Holstein, because we are so poor on churches, marketplaces. It's not, you know, such nice houses like on the marketplaces here in, in, in Pilsen or in other towns in Bohemia, you, you search without any success in Schleswig-Holstein. And that's the situation in the northern countries as well. Therefore, they like their archaeology so much. It's easier for them to in, identify with archaeology because they don't have so much other things. No, um, and so on. And the third point is, we all the time said the basis is our legislation of heritage management and protection. And only if we have a good heritage protection and we have it in our law, then we can write an application. Because UNESCO is not, it has certain rules that are fulfilled by the application, by the heritage management plan, by the law, that is working in this land. All this gives the, you know, the different yeah. it's, um, crosses or what's, yeah. yeah. And we said it will, it will not change anything because what is done in our law with the standard we will keep. So, and the people understood it. And then they ask, is UNESCO giving us money? And we said, no, they are bankrupt. So they have no money but we can use it to develop our area. It's complicated because, of course, there were two or three farmers that were writing letters in the new paper and newspaper and said it's a strange idea and so on. Therefore, we have this land consolidation process now to get, but they were five or six persons maybe. So, but it's a, it's a special situation with such a monument, with such a history. Well, um, uh, on uh, metal detecting, uh, metal, sorry, metal detecting, of course. Uh, did you focus on uh, finds uh, in the arable soil only, or did you also uh, include the uh, finds in, 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 the, in the intact archaeological? No, only in, the, uh, only in the arable soil. That's a, uh, that's a, um, that, 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 is, that is the limit, and so that's the metal detector is accepted. And um, we have changed. Uh, we were the first in Germany to invent the so-called cooperative model with the metal detectorist. Because we said, we educate you, you get a permission, and you work together with us. And they said, OK, we like to work together with you as archaeologists. In Schleswig-Holstein, again, we are very happy. Why? No Latin culture settlements. No Roman villas, no Roman vicos, and so on. We are relatively poor in metal finds, only Viking Age and Roman period Bronze Age. But we also changed our law, or we talked to the parliament to change our law. If you are doing illegal metal detecting in Schleswig-Holstein, it's not an Ordnungswidrigkeit anymore. Ordnungswidrigkeit means that's a 
10 euros you pay if you park incorrectly here. Then you pay your 10 euros, makes nothing. Aber ist ein Straftatbestand. That means if you go illegally with a metal detector, you go to court. And it can become very expensive and very, very, also could be very complicated because if you get a punishment, it's on your files, then you are not allowed to work for the public service anymore, for the police and so on. It creates problems. So what we have done, we have sharpened the law and we found now three, four, five hundred people who want to work together with us after our rules. And they are not, of course, allowed to go to woods and so on. But when we invite them and say we want to make a metal detection campaign in Hedeby, they are all there. If there are no more questions, we'll see you very much again. And uh, uh, we'll meet in the next week.